So this is a film that's part of our sense making series on Rebel Wisdom, and I'm joined by Jesse Single and Katie Herzog of the Blocked and Reported podcast. Welcome, guys. Um, we're, Thanks for having we're us. Be, cool. So we're going to be talking about the kind of ongoing death of journalism, the collapse of institutional authority, and big questions like that. You've started up your podcast, Blocked and Reported, at probably about the right time, I'd say, a very opportune moment. Could you, I'd love if you could just introduce yourselves very briefly and talk a little bit about what the podcast is for before we go into the details of the, the collapse of the media. Yeah, Jesse, you want to start? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesse Single. I'm a contributing writer at New York Magazine. Former staffer there. I've, I've written a lot about behavioral science. I'm uh, finishing up a book about behavioral science called The Quick Fix that will be out next year. And yeah, Katie and I started this podcast just because we had mostly because we had observed certain trends going on online that concerned us uh, with regard to, you know, people's inability to have substantive conversations and, and just discuss the world the way most people do over dinner table. Most, even just the way most left of center people do over the dinner table. And before I kick it to Katie, oh. I just want to be clear to your viewers. My Jufro is not normally so poofy. This is like a, a quarantine type situation. You're, uh, you're actually lucky that you're getting Jesse with a shirt. Normally, he likes to record topless. Um, my name is Katie Herzog, and I was, until, until pandemic, I was a staff writer at The Stranger, which is Seattle's alt-weekly, or alt-bi-weekly, I suppose now. Um, and before that, I worked for, I was a staff writer at Grist, which is a digital magazine that covers climate change and the environment. Um, yeah, like Jesse, I'm also sort of interested in, in the moment that we're in right now. We're both interested in human behavior and psychology. And so while the rest of the world is uh, is collapsing, it feels like, um, Jesse and I took the opportunity to capitalize on it. And it's working out pretty well for us with this podcast. Awesome. And I mean, we're all three of us journalists, so this might get a little bit inside baseball. So we're going to try and kind of keep it as big picture as possible. But I think there is a lot of uh, framing that we need to do kind of just going over the, the recent history, which feels like there's, there's a huge amount, even in the last two weeks. And I'd really direct people to your podcast if they want to kind of double click on any of it. But in particular, the, the New York times, um, the, the op-ed editor there left after some big um, kind of re rebellion inside the paper it seems to have been led by mostly the kind of the news staff. There was a tweet storm by Barry Weiss, who's an opinion writer there, controversial opinion writer there, or controversial to people inside the paper. She originally coined, she wrote the original article about the intellectual dark web that people might be familiar with. Um, and I think she, she laid out in a series of tweets kind of what she thought was going on inside the newsrooms, largely a kind of generational divide between sort of the new more woke journalists and an older kind of liberal class of journalists. And then there's a Matt Taibbi piece, which talked about, I think, eight different revolts inside newsrooms that seem to follow a similar pattern over the last couple of weeks. Um, there was a tweet by Matt Iglesias, who was one of the original founders of Vox, where he basically said he'd have to apologize for saying that this was a problem just con confined to university campuses. So all of this stuff was coming kind of thick and fast. Um, how would you, you summarize it? I mean, we can kind of double click on any of those and go into the details of it, but how would you summarize what's been going on over the last couple of weeks? Go for it, Katie. Uh, I would call what's going on a part of an element of what I see as an ongoing moral panic um, that has taken over lots of institutions across the world, particularly the Western world. Um, that seems to really have sunk its claws into journalism. And what we've been observing over the past couple of weeks, a lot of us have been observing for years, and it has just sort of broken open in a way that I think is more visible to the public right now, which is frankly a bit of a relief um, that this thing that 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 Jesse and I have been writing about and sort of trying to warn people about for years is now um, is now open. Um, so it's been wild to watch and, and uh, it feels very destabilizing, but also at least people are talking about it now and acknowledging some people at least are acknowledging that this this trend is um, is real. Yeah, I think Katie's giving me slightly too much credit because I, I think I in areas where I had done reporting, I had noticed a certain tendency to not treat questions journalistically and to, to really tip things too far in the activist direction. I don't think I realized how bad it was until around the time we started the podcast, maybe even after. Um, there's a sense that certain important norms of, of liberal values and particularly journalistic values are being tossed aside because it's a bit of a revolutionary moment. And 
my argument was and is that if, if you care about the world and you want to improve it and you care about things like police brutality and racial justice, uh, it, it has to be grounded in, in liberal values and in journalism and in science. And a lot of what's going on now is not that in part because people are afraid that if they say the wrong thing, and, and this happened this week or last week, a, a kid at a, a data scientist tweeted a respected study showing that in certain contexts, um, violent protests could be shown to not work relative to violent protests, which, you know, it's a complicated subject. He got fired because people said they were offended that he would even suggest that. And, and the academic study was by a black academic as well, I think. Omar Wasso, yeah, I think he's biracial, yeah. but yeah, identifies as black. Yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the most kind of, that seemed to be one of the most kind of intense examples. I was going to come to this a bit later in the conversation, but I think I'm going to come to it now because, Katie, you mentioned that it feels like everyone now realizes that there's a problem. It's not, that's not strictly true. I mean, there was an article by Nathan Robinson in Current Affairs that basically sort of poo-pooed the whole idea that there is this moral panic and was just saying that it's being used to attack the left. And if you look into these questions, it's, it's overblown or it's just right-wing agitators. So there, is, there are still people kind of saying, no, this, is, this isn't even happening. Yeah, that's definitely true. And there has been, that's been ongoing. So anybody who's written about quote unquote cancel culture over the past year. So every time there's an article or a piece about it, there's a backlash to that. And there's people, particularly people on the left who say, no, cancel culture isn't real. Cancel culture is just, uh, it's just, you know, a response to criticism. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's right wing grifters trying to, trying to sort of shield themselves from any sort of criticism. So that has been ongoing. I have seen people who before have said like, cancel culture isn't real in the past couple weeks say, okay, it's real, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so yes, there is there, the denial continues, but I think it's, it's harder, it's harder to deny for most people, both inside and outside of the, the echo chambers that we live in. I personally have had a few people actually do sort of the remarkable thing of apologize to me in the past couple of weeks for saying, you know, I thought you were crazy when you were writing about sort of the excesses of cancel culture over the past couple of years. And now that I see that you're right. So um, that's a new experience for me. But yeah, I think you're right. People are definitely, there's still a contingent of people who are very invested in denying that this, uh, this trend is, is happening. Yeah, what did you make of that article, Jesse? You know, there's been sort of a long, <clears throat> this is a whole subgenre of articles now that tries to make this out as though on the one hand are, you know, reactionary white men, and maybe Katie is an honorary reactionary white man. I identify as a reactionary white, white man. There we go. Um, so, so it's this, this totally oversimplified view where on the one hand are, are those evil reactionary white people who just want to continue being racist without consequences. On the other hand are the people fighting for social justice who just want them to stop being racist. This is a complete oversimplification because when we talk about cancel culture, however you define it, I, you know, I, people like Dave Chappelle are not affected by cancel culture because they're rich and powerful. Even people like me, much lower on the sort of power ladder, if anything, controversy has helped my career. I, I'm much more worried about, you know, David Shore, the kid who got, he's 28 years old. He got fired by his employer because of a dumb Twitter blow up. The Washington Post just wrote an article about a year and a half incident where a woman wore a ridiculous costume to a Halloween party with blackface. She got sort of uh, ostracized from the party. She left. She was humiliated. That wasn't enough. They had to dig it up a year and a half later. Now she's fired. She's a 40 or 50 something year old woman who will probably not have a job until her social security days because it wasn't enough that she was humiliated. So when we talk about cancel culture, it's this very punitive impulse. And if you have money and power, you will generally be protected from it. So it's, it's more vulnerable people who are more likely to be um, affected by it. So that's, that's usually my response when people claim this isn't a thing or that we shouldn't worry about it. Right. When uh, th this is always the response when people, the people, the people who say that cancel culture doesn't exist, they'll bring up, you know, like Jesse said, examples like Dave Chappelle, what they don't bring up is all the people that we haven't heard of, or these sort of minor non-famous characters who have been pushed out of their careers or of the employment system altogether. And I guess it's just a convenient sort of like you just point to the one who's doing well. And like Jesse, I think controversy has been good for my career. But for people who don't have sort of ambitions to be in the public eye, it can be terrible for your career and for your, you know, your social life, your friends drop you, your family shuns you. It's it's a phenomenon that's happening, but it's uh, some people certainly still deny it. Yeah. And I want to kind of focus on the, the moment right now. I mean, you, you guys and 
Rebel Wisdom, like I've, I've done interviews with Brett Weinstein uh, going back a couple of years. So I'm very well aware of these arguments. I think a lot of people watching will be familiar with the backstory and uh, how, how much this has been growing over the last few years. But just right now, I, I had a, a couple of texts from friends in newsrooms saying that things have shifted just in the last couple of weeks, that the kind of language that's being used. And when in the UK, we didn't really have that, the, the same kind of language as you have in, in the States, like the allyship and people of color. And that's not really English. That hasn't been English terminology. And he's saying that the, the, the tone of just the, the, the nature of the language in the newsroom has changed dramatically, even in the last two weeks. And the atmosphere in editorial meetings he described as incendiary. And that, what are you hearing from people, from, from friends or former colleagues in, in newsrooms? I mean, the same. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I heard uh, yesterday from a, a, a friend in a newsroom that at his newsroom, they have started, they, they started a book club, but the book club, it was sort of posed as like there's going to be a book club in this in this newsroom, but it has devolved into or maybe evolved into a book club about just like racial justice issues. So he was telling me about a meeting of this book club where white people were sitting around and just talking about their like it was like an AA meeting. They were saying like like one by one going by like my name is Katie and I'm a racist, um, which is a very bizarre thing to imagine happening in any workplace, much less a newsroom. Um, but it is happening. Yeah, I, and I think um, I've also heard from people who just don't really think they can do their jobs well anymore because, like, if you're covering – one example is just, like, the protests in the States, which have been, I think, overwhelmingly peaceful, and I think it, they've trended toward becoming more peaceful. But uh, if you're a journalist or you're sort of a public policy analyst, you might have something to say about the, the corner of them that weren't peaceful, and you might be able to want to – you will likely want to be able to speak openly about the effects of that violence or how that violence has affected businesses that gotten burned down. Just really basic forms of journalism and activism and, and policy analysis that people now feel afraid to do. So it's just a sort of a, some kind of spiral of silence thing going on maybe. And these aren't people who are seeking to express like far right views or anything. They're seeking to express views that a month ago felt unremarkable. Yeah, I think that spiral of silence piece is really interesting because I remember some of the coverage of the New York Times situation included people saying, well, on our, on our Slack channels, no one's supporting uh, or no, one, no one's speaking out against the, I think it was the sacking of, was it Tom Cotton? Or, uh, no, Cotton was the senator. James who, so James right. Bennett was sacked. But what's amazing about that is the Slack channels where they're saying, no one's speaking up in the other direction are, are in real time getting leaked by liberal Twitter users. And inevitably there's always an article later on this time by vice in another case by Huffington post leaking the entire contents of these. So of course you're not going to speak up because then you'll be the one dissenting voice in the, the inevitable HuffPo or Buzzfeed article. It's just very bad faith to say that because people aren't speaking up internally. I've, I've talked to multiple time staffers who are concerned about what's going on and they would not speak up because what's the incentive? And do you have a sense of why journalism has, do you think that it was sort of structural issues in journalism that have, that have kind of got it to the point where it's been taken over by this kind of situation? How, how would you frame it? It sort of feels a bit like a kind of mirror of the, of the whole pandemic to me, like a weak, a weak host being taken over via virus in double quick time. Jess, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've talked about this a little too, but some people, there's just like two simple catchphrases that particularly people on the right use, like go woke, go broke, as though people are, are these journalists, these outlets are struggling because of their political stances. But I think Katie and I both think the opposite is true, is that the structural problems with journalism go so far beyond ideology. There's just an entire business model has collapsed, a business model that 30 years ago was such that, you know, the Baltimore Sun and the Boston Globe could have foreign bureaus, which is unthinkable now. I think as an institution collapses, the culture inside it is going to get very weird. And, and in this case, what you see basically is that whatever concerns upper middle class graduates of elite universities is more and more what they care about. Uh, and that is where wokeness resides. So yeah, I think, I think obviously they feed back into one another because like, maybe people will stop reading certain publications as they get less and less trustworthy, but overall I'm much more in the camp of um, go broke, go woke than vice versa. Uh, 
Yeah, the structural stuff is a, is a much bigger deal. And it's all, and this goes back decades. This goes back to Craigslist and then social media. I mean, the business models have, have totally collapsed. I mean, just for instance, like the Seattle Times, the big sort of daily paper here 20 years ago had 5,000 staffers. Today, they have sold their buildings. They exist on two floors in a tiny building. It was apparently uh, the, the, the publisher was offered like $730 million in the early, early 2000s from, you know, Gannett or some like major corporation to buy this paper and today it is almost worthless um so that i mean that's really the issue is that the industry is failing and the response the response of that has been for everybody to sort of go kind of crazy in some ways um but it is not i think yeah the the structural issues really precede sort of the um the other things that are happening within within this and i also think this is also part of a broader a broader trend in the culture a lot of which has to do with sort of backlash against donald trump and a lot of fear about um you know him sort of ushering into uh people think that he's going to usher in you know a, a new age of fascism or authoritarianism into into the into the nation and so there's been this sort of uh, ben smith from the new york times calls it re resistance journalism and i do think there has been a trend over the past couple of years for journalists to really sort of see themselves more or maybe they still see themselves as journalists but they've really turned into activists um and you know and everybody sort of wants to be on the right side of history we're in such a weird moment in time that people are deeply concerned about the country, understandably, and they want to sort of do the right thing, but do the right thing in this case often means sort of shaking off these, uh, the values of journalism that have existed for a long time. I want to talk a little bit more about that dynamic because it seems, I'm thinking about the Intercept case as well, where one member of staff basically criticized another and the, and the other member of staff ended up having to apologize. And the Lee Fang was, was the member of staff who had to apologize. But if you think about the imbalance of power now with social media, any member of staff could criticize you publicly, even if you're a, a senior journalist and, and you, you're now potentially, so anything that can happen, any, any single uh, editorial process that happens, someone could leak at any point. So what, what does that do to, to journalism? What does, that, what's, what does that culture of fear look and feel like? Start a podcast. <laughs> I mean, well, luckily, I would, I would yeah. hate to be in journalism right now. Uh, our, our, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, Jesse and I are sort of free from, from these environments now because we started this podcast that, is, uh, that, that nobody has leaked our, leaked our chats yet. Although if Jesse pisses me off too much, maybe I'll do it. They're incredibly um, salacious. Yeah, but I hope like you said, leaked. it's a culture of fear. Right. Um, this, this, this culture of fear, and it does influence not just you know how people relate to each other within the workplace but also what gets covered um and i think that's a problem as well you know like jesse mentioned this washington post piece yesterday about a woman a total like a, a non-famous non-public figure who wore an offensive halloween costume two years ago i would imagine there was probably some some people who within the post who you know objected to the publication of, of this and like ruining this woman's life for over what is a, like really a microaggression. But what incentive would anybody have to speak out about that when the culture is going like full steam in this one direction and anybody who pushes back on that is accused of being racist or a bigot or against the, you know, on the wrong side of history. There's just absolutely no incentive to sort of speak your truth, um, to use a, a phrase uh, borrowed from, from progress, progressive, um, because the, the, the cost is just too high. Yeah, do you have anything to add to that, Jesse? No, just, just I, I, I found some of the reporting on this remarkable, particularly a Vox story where uh, the author didn't try to reach out to Barry Weiss and didn't try to reach out to anyone affected, which if, if I am not particularly well connected in journalism, if I am aware of time staffers pissed off by what's going on, there has to be a lot more of them. So I just, uh, it's the quality of the, of, of progressive journalism reporting on itself at the moment that also drives me crazy because I, it's like, it just seems there's sort of no uh, adults in the room. Yeah. I think that was a Vox article that mm -hmm. sort of framed itself as, the explainer of all you need to know about what's going on. And I think I, I remember you sort of saying that it was a, it was a really one-sided take yeah. on, on what was happening. Do you have a sense of what Matt Iglesias was referring to when he said that he, he needed to apologize for thinking it was just confined to university campuses? He seemed to be referring to something happening inside Vox. Yeah. Um... I think that's accurate. I think there's stuff going on in Vox. 
that sort of I there wouldn't want to see more than that. There was another guy at Vox, um, Zach Beauchamp, who, what, Jesse, do you remember what the tweet was exactly? Uh, no, it was Herman Lopez, uh, spelled German Lopez, who said something similar to Iglesias uh, that um, basically, I forget what he was responding to, but it's strongly implying that he agrees that there's something going on there. Um, but I think you could basically take what happened at the Times in a very public, spectacular way and imagine a thousand versions of that going on more quietly at any modern media outlet with a lot of sort of younger staffers and that would be accurate enough right and and so vox bought new york magazine and new york magazine is where andrew sullivan writes and andrew sullivan has uh apparently there's basically like a committee of like young staffers who now vet his columns and have the power to veto what andrew sullivan writes um, and i don't think that's because vox took it over i i'd heard rumors about this since uh, well before vox took over uh, bought, bought new york magazine um but it's a bizarre, bizarre twist. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And is it worth sort of unpacking what happened at the New York Times, just for people who maybe aren't familiar with it? Yeah. I mean, so basically Tom Cotton wrote an op-ed saying that the troops should be called in to quell uh, looters and rioters. It was people subsequently claimed he was saying the troops should be called in to just murder protesters. That wasn't what he said. He'd also done some tweets that were like pretty far right and suggested maybe he was toning down his true beliefs in the column. The point is the column staked out a, I would say right-wing position, but one that there's a fair amount of US polling and support for. It gets a little bit fuzzy with question wording. Also, he's suggesting like the army gets sent in even in cities where the governor or mayor doesn't want them, which is, you know, pretty extreme policy. A bunch of time staffers tweeted in unison that this column put Black Times journalists in danger, which is a very hard thing to, to figure out what that means, how Tom Cotton publishing this column in the Times versus Breitbart or Medium, how that's the difference between journalists being safe and being in danger. And I think my reaction to this, and I think Katie's, was, was partly about the Times bending over backward to pretend this has been some horrible editorial breach rather than just a right-wing column people freaked out at, but also it's creepy watching a bunch of, of journalists you know, responsible for bringing us the truth, all tweeting the same thing in unison that is questionable at best. So it was just, I don't think the Times acquitted itself well during that. Sorry, Katie. I think that it's also for people, especially in the UK who might not know this, um, Tom Cotton is a, is a sitting US senator. Yep. Um, so he is a, a man who actually does power, have power in the world. He does not have the power to unilaterally send troops into, you know, the, the, the streets of the United States. Um, but he is, you know, he is a, a notable figure in this country. Um, and I, as Jesse mentioned, so all of these time staffers replied in unison, this piece uh, endangers Black Times journalists or, or Black Times staffers or something like that. And in subsequent recording that was published actually in the New York Times, um, the staffers said like the reason we went with the sort of, we went with the harm angle for a reason because the, you know, you can't just say, I don't like this, right? Because then it becomes a free speech issue, an intellectual freedom issue. So they found the sort of one like little narrow, narrow position that would allow them to take a sort of more the moral high ground here while while trying not to appear as censors which is exactly what they were doing yeah and i think it's worth also emphasizing there were two pieces that came out afterwards that i thought were very interesting one as you mentioned jesse that the the polling suggests that actually what tom cotton was calling for is actually quite popular um in in the american public so if you're basically saying that's not acceptable you're saying I've seen up to like 47% of people saying that that was, that they might've been in favor of that. Yeah. To be clear, that was a, a slightly different question, but I think what you're saying is accurate. There's at the very least would be, you would think 40 or 45% support for what he's saying, depending on how you phrase the question. It was not for better or worse. It was not an outlier opinion the way some people made it out to be. Yeah. And also the, the point was made that that's why you publish things like that, because actually in retrospect, it turned out to have been, premature it turned out to have been bad advice and if you stop those opinions being put out there you don't have a record of that actually it's it's probably not um it looks certainly premature and maybe ill-advised in retrospect what he was arguing for yeah right. i mean that is a good point he happened to be very wrong and and the the key takeaway here is going to be the times having made a fool of itself and, and sort of acted on acting on journalistically rather than what the story should be which is tom cotton was a reactionary idiot here yeah, 
and you, you deprive the chance of, of actually ha that being exposed in the marketplace of, of ideas by uh, preventing him from making the argument in the first place. I'm interested. Right. And well. what? Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. oh, one more point about that. So he, like he could have published this on any right wing site, but he didn't. And I think that's actually a good thing because w we live in these very narrow media bubbles and echo chambers. So if he had published this on Breitbart or the Federalist or the Washington Examiner or whatever, it wouldn't have made a storm. People wouldn't have even like people on the on the left. This would have made they would they wouldn't have it wouldn't have registered. Um, and now people know. And the fact that like the Times is like sort of forcing it's mostly liberal readership to contend with th these ideas, I think is a good thing. Um, but time staffers obviously disagree. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to pick up, you mentioned that they chose a particular angle for it, Katie, like the sort of, and I think Barry Wise framed it as safetyism. So going back to Jonathan Haidt's work with the coddling of the American mind and the idea that there is a culture of safetyism, I know that you, I heard your, in your podcast, Jesse, you kind of disagreed with Barry a little bit on this. But, but, but you seem to be saying that you thought it was safetyism, Katie. Is that right? I think, I think safety is, excuse me, I think safetyism is an angle. I think they were trying to turn it into a labor issue um, just to, to appear as though, as though it was not about censorship. Um, I think it was sort of a convenient angle that they took. I do think that safetyism is very widespread, um, especially in sort of elite institutions. People, for, it's sort of uh, the quintessential safetyist environment is a college and all of these people sort of come from academia or at least are college educated. Um, but I think it was an excuse, um, you know, and, and one that, that seemed legitimate to an awful lot of people. Um, why did you disagree with that as a as an explanation, Jesse? I don't think we disagree that much. I think <clears throat> saying that the column could harm black journalists is an, is an instant state. <laughs> I can't talk. Is a manifestation of safetyism. I thought in terms of framing what the opposing sides are, I don't think it's true that one side is like safetyism, the other is not. Like for example, I think a lot of conservatives have have really bad issues of safetyism with their own when they say you know, flag burning does some real harm to America or Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. I, they have all sorts of stuff they freak out at. So I, I just, I think it's a natural human inclination. And I think as we laid out on the podcast, you can get a little bit more specific in journalistic context of, of the norms that are, are being fought over here. And, and that includes norms like, you know, uh, how far to the right an opinion are we willing to publish or, or should we judge stuff from, um, the ideological outgroup at a, at a higher, more stringent standard for quality, stuff like that. I'd love to um, go a little bit back over your, your personal history, because you've both had kind of relatively high profile run-ins with, you've both written about uh, trans and then had quite high profile run-ins or at least caused controversy with, with trans activists. I'd love if you could just summarize that, that backstory and we can kind of ask a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so in 2017, I was a freelancer um, and I wrote a piece for The Stranger called The Detransitioners. And it was what it sounds like. It was a piece about people who transitioned from one sex or gender to the other and then and then changed their mind and, and transitioned back. Um, and this was a, it was deeply reported. It wasn't an opinion piece. I, I took every sort of um, precaution in terms of getting happily trans voices in there, talking about how transition, you know, does seem to alleviate gender dysphoria for an awful lot of people. Um, I had trans sensitivity readers, but there was still this sort of massive firestorm. And I don't know how many people who hated the piece actually read the piece. Um, and that's, this is actually how I, I met Jesse for the first time. I, or, uh, through, through email, I, I, when I was working on the piece, I got in touch with Jesse to, to try to interview him. Um, for a section that ultimately didn't didn't get published, um, and there was just this like people were actually burning stacks of the paper. There were flyers up in coffee shops in my neighborhood calling me transphobic, and that really changed the course of my career for the better. To be honest, I mean, there's some irony here: is that the the the, the freak out that everybody had about it really elevated my profile. It got me a lot more opportunities. I ultimately was offered a staff job at the paper. And I don't think any of that would have happened if people had just sort of read the piece and said like, I disagree with it, but no big deal, you know? Um, and that, that happens, it happens sort of, sort of frequently. Um, you know, it's emotionally difficult to go through this experience, but ultimately it was, it was 
you know, probably the best, the best move in my career. Um, but it's still, I have gotten, since that piece was published, and I would say there's nothing transphobic about it, that is my reputation. If you ask like a random person who reads The Stranger on the streets of Seattle who Katie Herzog is, they would probably say she's the transphobe, which is patently false. Um, but that's just sort of what happens, you know? Anybody who, who has the temerity to question some aspects of, of the, the current trans dogma is automatically pegged as a bigot. Um, and, you know, this has happened not just, with, not just with journalists, it's happened with academics, with J.K. Rowling recently, of course. Um, just a lot of people have gone through sort of a similar experience. Uh, so yes, my, sir. yeah, mine <clears throat> was also about trans issues. It was really a pair of articles. In one of them, I looked into the allegations against the doctor who ran a gender clinic in Toronto. He'd been accused of conversion therapy and his clinic had been shut down and he had been fired. A lot of kids had lost access to their care. Uh, the accusations against him were almost entirely false. One of them was completely wrong. It was a, a misunderstanding on the part of the accuser. We acknowledged that after I pointed out inconsistencies in his story. Um, I was seen as defending the indefensible. It was other journalists seemed to think that because this guy had been accused of transphobia and we all know transphobia is wrong, I should just take the activist views at face value. Instead, I looked into them and I found they were false and I did what journalists do or, or used to do and printed a story that went against the common wisdom that I'm very proud of to this day. Then a couple summers ago, today's actually the two day anniversary of it, Facebook informed me. Uh, Happy anniversary, Jesse. <laughs> thank you. I had a cover story in the Atlantic about uh, gender dysphoria among young people and what the process should be, be, look like for a, a 12 or 13 year old in particular, and especially one with sort of complex other mental health problems. You know, what should the process look like before we put them on hormones, before we consider surgery for older teenagers? It's a 12 or 13,000 word story that I'm immensely proud of. And I was the beneficiary of like expert fact checking and there's nothing transphobic about it, but is viewed as basically like at least adjacent to a hate crime for even suggesting that some people regret transition, which some people do, or that some kids are rushed into transition, which they are. So yeah, that um, it's sort of the same deal as Katie, where our situation socially were different because I have like very vanilla Obama liberal friends and Katie's from like a, a more radical queer community or was at the time. So I didn't, I didn't lose real friends over it, but a subset of left of center journalists uh, still view me as just a, a evil bigot. And when I try to ask them to point to stuff I've actually written to support that assessment, they can't. So it's just sort of a meme at this point. And one of the things that's been very frustrating and enlightening is watching professional journalists sort of launch accusations without any evidence and without caring about the evidence. So I think Katie and I are, extremely sad journalism is burning down for structural reasons, but like, you know, it's gratifying to be able to build our own platform and not have to worry about those sorts of people at all. Yeah. Jesse's, Jesse's firestorm was much, much bigger than mine. I mean, Lena Dunham called you an asshole, right? I mean, you are an <laughs> asshole, but she, an asshole. she doesn't actually know you. She called me that, I think in the third person sense, not to me, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it got, yeah. it got pretty intense. Yeah. I think yours was worse in terms of sort of the interpersonal damage. Mine might right. have temporarily been higher profile, but I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, because I mean, you you both sort of um, I think are saying that it was on the on the whole sort of a net positive for your careers. But I'm interested in how it was to go through that experience because I know there aren't that many people who have a um, what did Jezebel Jezebel wrote a story called <laughs> what is what is Jesse Singles fucking deal is that right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, and that investigative so, journalism. So in that story, the... Did uh, they find out, though? If they found out, that's... They did it. That's my biggest secret. If it gets out what my fucking deal is, my career is over. Um, I'm going no, to end up writing that piece. <laughs> well, that was a good example, because... Katie, do you remember the author's name? Off the, Heron Walker is the author. Uh, Heron Walker, yeah. She, she spams my email with... Um, uh, emails that just say, what's your fucking deal? What's your deal? What's your deal? What's your deal? No attempt to do an actual interview. I'm obviously not going to respond to that. Then they, they run a piece that gets my views wrong, that, that absolutely misrepresents what I said. There were similar pieces in Slate and, and the New York Times. So it obviously sucks to have a bunch of people on Twitter call you a bigot and, and you know, I don't know if it was harassment, but it was annoying at the very least. I didn't get death threats or anything. Uh, or I only got one death threat from a, well, borderline from a journalist actually. But seeing your work misrepresented in mainstream outlets that just don't care what you actually wrote because it's so important for them to chime in on the right side of a controversy. 
I found it insane that I had to deal with writing a letter to the editor to, to correct something in the New York Times. Like, you know, this is what we call a first world problem. Like I, very good life, I'm lucky, but it's just, it, 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 it saps away at your soul a little bit to watch people just lie about you without any sort of consequences. And it also, for me, it was also sort of destabilizing in the sense that I had previously lived in a world where I trusted the media, you know, where I trusted um, people to interpret things, to like read things before they interpret them. And that I was, I was just sort of shown um, in a very visceral way that you basically can't trust, you can't trust what you read oftentimes. And that has, that has been reinforced over the, over the last few years. Um, and as Jesse, Jesse mentioned, I think it had a higher social cost for me because I'm gay and most of the social networks that I existed in for my entire adulthood have been sort of radical queer circles. Um, and I was basically shunned by my social networks and I, I still am. I had, I had, there was on, on one occasion I was walking up the street um, near my house and I saw saw an ex of mine who I had been on like very good terms with someone I had remained close with after we broke up and we were walking on the same side of the street and she just, I was passing her and she just turned around, you know, it, it was like, I wasn't there. Um, and Seattle is sort of a, a like notoriously passive aggressive city. So I wasn't super worried about people. Um, I, I, at first I was sort of worried about being like accosted on the street. Um, but what I realized is that people were more likely to like dive into the bushes when they saw me coming and then shit talk me online. That's more of a, more of a Seattle uh, go-to response to any sort of conflict, but it was very, um, it was very isolating. Uh, I felt totally friendless because I was all of a sudden totally friendless and it, it, it hasn't really rebounded. I, I, I think that I still am sort of a, um, I think a lot of my sort of former friends and, and allies would consider me sort of a pariah or a thought criminal, or they probably think I'm like an all right neo-Nazi. There, there are still, I mean, there are stickers up in Seattle. There are like four different versions of stickers in Seattle calling me some version of a bigot. Um, just recently during the uh, all of this sort of protests. So my office in Seattle, my former office is in Chaz, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone that has sort of made international news. It's this area in Seattle that has been taken over by protesters. And um, and uh, so my office is right is right in that. And on the one of the first days of the, the sort of protest down there, the um, the I don't know, maybe it was riots down there, maybe it was protests, I don't know how much looting was happening. Um, someone graffitied fuck Herzog on the door of my former office. And this is all a response to, you know, this one piece. And subsequently, like, uh, once I got hired at the paper, I continued to write things that um, I didn't think were particularly inflammatory, but a lot of people did. Just things like, you know, questioning sort of the excesses of Me Too, writing about concern for due process, concern for, you know, the um, diminishing values of free speech, these liberal values that I think are, are incredibly important. Um, and so my reputation within Seattle is, I think, basically as a, as a, you know, like a literal Nazi, um, which is a very, a very strange sort of rebranding. It's not what I ever would have expected, you know, like even five or five or six years ago. Um, so it's been weird. And how would you describe your political views, maybe to both of you? I, I'm just sort of a like a milk toast liberal. I mean, probably farther to the left than most Americans. Um, my values have changed a little bit. I think I am since all this sort of happened. One of the sort of more interesting, but also destabilizing and disorienting parts of this experience was that before I wrote this piece and before the response to this piece, I had sort of the blanket assumption that everything on the left was correct and everything on the right was wrong. And the response to my piece sort of opened my eyes to the fact that my side, my ideological allies, my tribe could be wrong because I knew they were wrong about this piece. Um, and, and once you see that, there's sort of no going back. And that doesn't mean that I've become a Republican. I haven't, for sure. I think I have drifted towards more sort of civil libertarian values, not so much in a financial sense, but um, as the culture has changed over the past couple of years, I have become much more concerned about civil liberties as the left has, in many cases, sort of, you know, even the ACLU has sort of given up on the values of free speech and free expression. Um, and so I think my politics have changed a little bit, but in terms of how I vote, I'm just sort of a, a basic like milk toast Democrat. Um, you know, in 2016, I supported Bernie Sanders. I voted for Hillary Clinton. This time around, I will vote for whoever, you know, it will be Joe Biden. 
presumably, but I will vote for whoever is running against Donald Trump. So pretty just sort of standard normative politics um, that were, you know, if I looked at polling, I'm probably further, you know, further to the left than, than the vast majority of Americans, but I'm not like, a, you know, I'm not a rose emoji Marxist or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm somewhat similar, I guess, like if it was, if we're talking about the other redistributive questions we basically no one ever talks about because we don't <laughs> there's always who dressed in blackface right. at the Halloween party in terms of who whose tax money goes where or at least I'm oversimplifying but not by much these days um I, th I think I'm pretty far to the left I mean I uh, I was torn between Bernie Sanders and Liz Warren again if you actually laid us out on sort of some spectrum of American opinion we would both be pretty far to the left and I'm you know I don't know really what to call myself other than a liberal or leftist or progressive I I I wish that on cultural stuff, like cancel culture stuff, what Katie's describing, sort of cultural libertarianism, I think should be a part of progressivism or a part of the left, in part because if we're on the left, we should care about people who have less power. And any punitive system of dealing with crime, with infractions at work, with microaggressions, is going to come down harder on more vulnerable people. Like, again... Dave Chappelle is not the victim of cancel culture. He could do 15 deeply offensive segments and still have millions of dollars. So it, it, I resent the fact, you know, no hate for libertarians, but I'm not a libertarian. And I, I don't think I should have to adopt a cultural libertarian uh, label just to make arguments like some hapless woman shouldn't lose her job over a bad Halloween costume a year and a half ago. And I think the left harms itself greatly by, by leaving that territory for the right to claim, sometimes in a bad faith way, because the right has its own cancel culture. But why would we see just like these aspects of basic human dignity and, and the chance for redemption, all the stuff that like gives humanity potential? I think that frustrates me. Yeah, I would, I'd like to add one thing. I think in an ideal world, these labels, we would give, get rid of the labels altogether. And I, and I know that's never going to happen. But I've sort of drifted away from sort of wrapping my identity up with my political affiliations or my political positions. So for, for one thing, I, I no longer would call myself a feminist or an environmentalist or these labels that, that had some more meaning to me a few years ago, because I've found that when your identity is wrapped up in, in a movement or a label like this, it becomes harder to evaluate the position based on their merits and not sort of your own sort of emotional response, um, you know, to the label itself, you know, liberals good, conservatives bad or, or vice versa or whatever it is. So I think in an ideal world, you know, we would look at every issue for its merits and not uh, based on who's making the argument, but we don't live in that world. Um, so I'm going to consider, I'm going to keep calling myself a liberal because that's how I vote. And those are sort of the, the policies I typically agree with. Um, but I wish that, I wish that we didn't have to, I wish that, that sort of we could do away with these designations and, um, and just look at issues without the sort of added baggage of these labels. Yeah, I think I'd agree. I mean, I'm, I was brought up in a very left wing family. I've always kind of considered myself, um, we, we don't quite use liberal in the same way as you use it there as a political affiliation, but I'm certainly a disaffected uh, left winger. But I'm also, and I think I heard you refer to this, Jesse, in one of the recent podcasts, wary of how that kind of can be weaponized as well. Like the Dave Rubin, I've been quite critical in the past of Dave Rubin for that, just the sort of singular focus on the left yeah. and, the, and the faults of the left. Like even, even that kind of disaffected liberal kind of, identity can be sort of part of the weaponized as part of a culture war, which I'm very wary of. Yeah. I mean, you see people, Katie and I have talked about this, like people who are like, well, political correctness has gone so far. I'm just, I'm just going to vote for Trump. I can't stand this anymore, which to me is a severe misunderstanding of power or an inability to put things in perspective because like on the whole, if I have to live with a world with, more cancel culture, but Biden rather than Trump is, is choosing Supreme Court nominees and who to stock the Environmental Protection Agency with, you know, I would choose that world. It's just, I think if you're in journalism or academia, you, you need to be vigilant because stuff is getting really bad and, and you need to be able to fight two battles at once. But I think there is this sort of cottage industry of like um, people who, who posit themselves as disillusioned liberals, but if you actually watch what they say and write, like the furthest their liberalism goes is saying they're, well, in Ruben's case is gay, or like in favor of gay marriage, which like in 2020 is like right. not a particularly lefty position. So, so yeah, I'm wary of that. And I, I do think that I, what I hope our podcast will do is the, the sort of discourse landscape 
mainstream circles is so bare and I hope that we can sort of be like a net to prevent people from falling through towards sort of more reactionary stuff because we again the worst thing you can say about our politics is is we sometimes have boring liberal tendencies but we have uh I think Donald Trump's election was a fucking disaster for I don't know if we can swear <laughs> Donald Trump's election was a disaster for America and the most important thing is to make sure uh it doesn't happen again yeah and I I guess you're in a really interesting position now. Um, how long is it since you set the podcast up? A month and four days. Uh, well, the podcast, a few months. The Patreon, a month and four days. Wow. And you've already, you're already doing pretty well. I'd urge anyone listening to check it out and to, to sign up on Patreon. Um, but, it, but it does seem like you're in a very interesting position because you've created an environment where you can speak your mind in, an, in, a, in a time where a lot of journalists feel that they can't. How, how do you sort of see it now? Where, where do you sort of see yourselves and um, how do you see the future of the, of the podcast? Um, I think the future for the podcast is, is bright as long as Jesse and I manage not to kill each other. Um, it's been just, uh, it's been really remarkable. I, I, if you had asked me, you know, when I was laid off during a pandemic, if this was ultimate, would ultimately be good for my career, I would have thought you were crazy. But it, the response has been really remarkable to see. And I think part of that, I, you know, I hear from people, Jesse and I both hear from people all the time who say, I can't have these conversations with my friends. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm going crazy. Thank you for making me feel less crazy. And yeah, we're, I don't think we're doing anything particularly remarkable, but there's something right now about just like speaking honestly about our observations about the world that is really resonating with people because they're not getting that anywhere else. Um, and so for me, you know, coming from a, a staff writer position, if I had been covering the protests and, and the pandemic and everything that's been happening over the past couple months within my, my former job, I would have felt really constrained about what I was able to say and what I wasn't able to say. And I mostly wrote opinion pieces um, for the paper, but my opinion just wasn't aligned with a lot of my colleagues. And there's such pressure to conform and such sort of internal sort of, you know, conflict when there's one person who is who has a slightly, slightly different, you know, perspective on things, that it feels very constraining. And so now I feel free for the first time ever, you know, and, and the only person I have to really worry about is pissing off is Jesse. And uh, it's, luckily he's pretty tolerant. <laughs> for now. For now. We'll see how long it lasts. Yeah, I mean, I would just echo everything she's saying. For me, it, it's a huge relief to just to be able to vent about this stuff. And also just the, the emails we're getting – they're like, they're thanking us as though we're providing some life preserving or sanity preserving service, which is crazy because I know we're not, I, I think we put out a good product, but it's just a sign that like mainstream outlets are not providing this very basic service of just normal analysis and journalism. So I think our success like is tied directly to the fact that jur like so many outlets have just gone off the rails and it's, it's crazy that we should be able to quickly build out a, a, podcast that you know will support almost a full-time like it's it's just crazy and it, it, it i just want to make it clear because i want the take-home point i want to be here is not that we have launched a successful podcast as proud as i am of that but that that what the hell are other outlets doing like how can between us and the other outlets that are <clears throat> the other podcasts that are significantly left but not really into like the super woke thing there's clearly a market of this people will hand over their money the cost of a subscription to like a streaming service just for our podcast. What does that tell you about what, what the market isn't serving right now? I don't, I don't think it's because Katie and I are particularly geniuses, although I wish I could say that was the answer. Yeah. And just, just as a final piece, I'd like to read from an article that was written today, unheard published something that speaks to what you were just saying, Katie. And I think I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this as sort of the response to to Trump's victory in 2016, and also why this is significant. It's not just a kind of um, inside journalism story. This is, this is a lot of the, the tastemakers and the opinion formers of an awful lot of people of a lot of, um, and a lot of values. Um, so yeah, I just want to read this quote. This isn't just a media story. It's a story about the epistemological rupture in the US polity that was provoked by the events of 2016 and has since grown more extreme. In isolation, these moral panics and collective mental breakdowns can be difficult to make sense of, but when you see them through the prism of America's current status as a rapidly declining hegemonic power, it all becomes much more intelligible.
I think that that's sort of frighteningly uh, astute. Um, things are crazy, and you know, and obviously the, a lot of the same elements are happening in the UK. Um, but you know, there's a there's Trump or there's Boris Johnson or something, and then there's a, an immense backlash um, to try to sort of to write to write the ship. Um, but then there, you know, there's the backlash of the backlash, and the writing of the ship might end up, you know, just tossing the ship over to the the other direction. Yeah, I, I, there's definitely something, some sort of epistemic breach going on. His, that quote reminded me of, um, we don't know, need to get into this whole thing, but this whole, the, the Covington Catholic scandal from a year or two ago where a bunch of kids were filmed. At first, it seemed like they were mocking and harassing this Native American elder. They weren't. Like the progressive media was completely wrong about it, but there was this real unwillingness on the part of many progressives to see what was before us, what was before our own eyes. And for me, that was like a radicalizing moment because I just realized, People, uh, to, to look at a video and not see what's on the video, to continue to say that this was like a borderline hate crime rather than, you know, a few kids did the, the tomahawk chop, which is a little offensive, but thousands of people do it every year at uh, sporting events. That, I think epistemic breach is really right. So when you talk about things like ruptures in the Times newsroom, if you could really dig into them and figure out the arguments people are making, they have to do with questions like, do you, do you challenge the testimonies of people from marginalized groups? What constitutes knowledge? What constitutes sufficient evidence? And I think for a long time on the left, we didn't really, we ignored that there were these breaches, but um, Trump and then I, I think the pandemic mixed with the protests has like been this Trump-like event almost that has just starting to really crack up the left in ways that could be I think dangerous, but there's also some potential upside. So I'm just very curious how, and scared about how things are going to go. It's a good time to be an independent podcaster who's contrarian left. Yeah. I'll say yeah. that. Cool. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, definitely go and check out the podcast. I'll put the details in the show notes below. And I'm sure we'll catch up again and see how bad things have got uh, in, a, <laughs> in a few months' time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change. Which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching. See you soon.